Good afternoon. Welcome back to another rendition of the BH Virtual Event Space. You are tuned in to Power and Beauty, learning to photograph bound brown bears with David Swindler. Wow. I'm learning to speak over here, David. So we gotta <laughs> we gotta walk before we can run. What's going on, man? How you been? I've been doing great. Thanks so much for having me on the show today. Ah, it's great to have you back with the event space doing another workshop with us. Uh, I'm going to remind all of our viewers that if you do have any questions at all, you can always get them in. So whether you're joining us on Vimeo live stream or Facebook, you can drop your question in the comment section. We'll get it asked to David before the end of today's presentation. So that being said, we're going to kick it over to David. All right. Well, thank you so much. So let me go ahead and get my screen shared over here. And as, as you said, you know, the title of my presentation is Power and Beauty, Photographing Brown Bears. You know, I love photographing wildlife, but especially I love bears, whether it be brown bears or polar bears, they're just such interesting subjects to photograph. And so during this presentation, I'm going to give you a bunch of my tips and tricks for getting your best possible shots of brown bears. So let's jump on into it and make sure that this is working. So a little bit about me. So I grew up in the great state of Iowa. And Iowa is not really known for having big dramatic landscapes or anything like that. So the first time I went out and saw the Grand Canyon as, uh, as a kid, it just blew my mind. I was like amazed at how, how awesome the Southwest landscapes were. And one night we were camping out on the North Rim of the Grand Canyon and I stepped out of my tent in the middle of the night to use the bathroom. And I looked up into the sky and I saw stars like I had never seen them before in my entire life. So vivid, so clear. It's almost like I could just reach up there and just grab them. And I just stood in awe for quite a few moments, just looking up at the sky. And I thought at that time, I have to come back here. Well, I ended up um, getting a degree in chemical engineering. And during the course of my studies, I fell in love with the science of semiconductor processing. So I got a job in research and development with a semiconductor firm. And my specialty was photolithography. Now, it's a really fancy term, but it has a lot of direct analogs to what we do as photographers. But I worked in semiconductors for about 10 years. And one summer, I was out backpacking around Mount Rainier National Park. The wildflowers were amazing. I was having the time of my life. But I kept having this thought in the back of my mind. It's like, do I want to keep doing this job for the next 10 years? And finally, I came to the realization that, no, I didn't. But I didn't know what I was going to do if I wasn't going to do this job. But I made a commitment there around that mountain that I would quit my job at the next good opportunity. Now, I thought, no, the next good opportunity might be two or three years out. I'll have time to get stuff figured out. But as fate would have it, the day I got back to work, they announced a voluntary severance program. And I said, well, this is a good opportunity I asked for. So I went into my boss's office and I told him, hey, I'm going to take the package. And that was the end of my semiconductor career. And eventually, after a bit of soul searching and, and trying to figure out what I wanted to do, I started a company called Action Photo Tours. And I guess where I went? I went back to the Southwest because I absolutely loved that area. And so I started the company back in 2014 and I based it in Kanab, Utah. Probably a place you haven't heard of very often, but the reason why I love Kanab is because it's central to all the places in the Southwest I love most. You got the Grand Canyon just to the south, I'm Kitty Corner to Zion National Park, Bryce Canyon to the north, and the Grand Staircase Escalante. I've got the Wave, White Pocket, Lake Powell, Monument Valley. You know, it's endless out there. And, and as part of Action Photo Tours, we offer a large variety of tours and multi-day workshops in the desert southwest, the Pacific Northwest, Alaska, and beyond the borders. So I invite you to check out our website, actionphototours.com, and I'd love to have you follow me on Facebook or Instagram, always trying to share photos and insight and everything else on social media. And here's just a little snippet from uh, the, our conference earlier this year. And the three pillars of the Outsiders is to connect, capture, and conserve. And this event is directly geared towards nature photographers, whether it be landscape photographers, night photographers, wildlife, etc. I want to start off with a story. So this small bear family, mom and two cubs, decides that they're going to go cross the river. Now, when they cross the river, they have to be really careful. 
because there can be um, dangers on the other side of the river that they may not be able to see until it's too late. And so they're crossing the river, trying to look all around them and be, be super cautious. And then all of a sudden something spooks them that they see, maybe it's a movement or something on the other bank. And so the cubs start running and they, and they run close to where mom is. And so they run over to the small island in the river to kind of get a better look around them. So they get over to that little island and uh, the cubs start standing up, the mom stands up a bit and they start all looking around. Then they notice something. Oh, what's going on back there? They look a little bit more intensely. Oh no, look at that male bear that's starting to come. Now male bears, they will actually eat cubs because if the, if the mom doesn't have any more cubs, she'll go back into heat and he can mate with her. And so the moms have to be really cautious around male bears if, if she has cubs with her. And so guess what? They've got to move. They take off. They're not wasting any time. They're splashing through that water, running at full speed. Now they're almost to the bank. I love how you can see one of the cubs just kind of looking back to make sure that his sibling is going to also make it there with them. And they're able to make it to the bank and get away from the, the source of danger. And so when I'm out there photographing wildlife, and especially with bears, you know, I like to look for these types of shots where I can tell a really good story. You know, I find wildlife to be a, a difficult thing to photograph because in order to make this one single frame that you're trying to publish or put out there, to make it compelling, it really has to be engaging to the viewer. It can't just be an animal standing there. There's a billion and a half of those photos all floating around the web and on Instagram. But in order to have a photo that commands attention, especially with wildlife, it really needs to invoke the, the viewer's emotions and be able to tell that narrative. So the outline of my talk today is I'm gonna discuss a little bit about brown bears, and then we'll talk about safety around brown bears. Then we'll go into some of the bear activities that they will be engaged in and things that you'll want to photograph. We'll talk about where and when to go and the photo gear you'll need to, to, to take those good shots. And then we'll go over some shooting techniques and end with some notes on composition. So first of all, where do brown bears reside? Well, as you can see in the red highlighted regions up above, uh, these brown bears, otherwise known as like grizzly bears, they're found throughout uh, the north, northern region, reaches of like Alaska, Canada, and Eurasia. And you know, these bears are identified by that distinctive hump on their back, the dish-shaped face, and also their long claws. And they can also be found in the lower 48 in a few places, not very many, but places like Yellowstone National Park and Glacier National Park, but in much smaller numbers. And brown bears have a worldwide population of around 200,000. And about 60% of them, interestingly enough, are over in Russia. And about the other 30% or so are in Alaska and Canada. So a few facts about brown bears. They can weigh anywhere between 300 to 1,200 pounds, depending on the habitat, sex, and the location. And you know there is about a 30% difference, you know, in sexual dimorphism between uh, a male bear and a female bear. You know, the male bears are always going to be about that 30% larger. And then they can live, you know, anywhere between 15 to 25 years. But the longest they see and really live in the wild is around 30 years. And they are omnivores, you know, they'll eat things like plants, berries, fish, and other small mammals. And over short distances, even though they're really big, they can run up to 30 miles an hour, which is quite impressive. And there's no way you're gonna be able to run away from a bear if it wants to get you. And brown bears primarily live a solitary life. And they only come together to mate or to take advantage of consolidated food sources. And they hibernate for up to five to eight months during the coldest months of the year. And during that time, they live only off their fat reserves. So before they go into hibernation, they've just got to eat so much food in order to accumulate those fat buildups so, so that they can successfully hibernate. And during the hibernation, they'll lose 15 to 30 percent of their overall weight. But what's really interesting about brown bears is that they actually gain lean body mass during hibernation due to the recycling of the waste products. 
So that urea that they produce, you know, it gets converted into nitrogen byproducts and it actually increases their muscle mass during hibernation. And that's something the medical community is intensely studying because, you know, it could have great uh, implications for preventing atrophy in humans. And so here's a shot here of some of uh, uh, kind of what the mating behavior will look like if you do ever get to go see that. So as far as safety goes, bear attacks are relatively rare. You know, they kill on average about three people a year in the U.S. and Canada. And I heard a fact somewhere that, you know, dogs just in the U.S. alone, they'll kill anywhere like 40 to 50 people a year. So if you say, well, what's more dangerous, bears or dogs? Well, uh, yeah, let the facts speak for themselves. The, the thing is, is most bears want to avoid humans. They don't want much to do with us, and they would just rather go away and do their own thing, unless they're actively provoked. Now, what are some of the reasons for a bear attack? Well, the primary one is that they're trying to protect their young. Uh, the second most common is that they got surprised. Like you're walking through tall grass, and all of a sudden you surprise a bear, and they don't know what just popped up in front of them. And then a couple other reasons are for hunger or for predation or to kind of mark out their territory. And, you know, one time uh, we were out hiking in Glacier National Park and uh, we saw a bear off the side of the trail and this bear was acting really strange. You know, it was growling. It was kind of trying to mock charge the brush at us. We're like, whoa, what's going on here? So we just kind of start slowly walking away, backing up. And then all of a sudden, the reason for the, this bear's uh, uh, temper became clear. Because somehow, when we were hiking on that trail, we got in between her and her two cubs on the other side of the trail. And once we backed up enough, those two cubs ran across the trail and rejoined their mother. And then they went on their merry way. And almost all the wilderness attacks happen to groups of one or two humans. And so the, one of the best ways to stay safe in bear country is just to go with a larger group of people. Because when you're with a large group of people, you then become the biggest bear out there. If they see a group of three or four people all standing together, you're like, whoa, that's a big bear over there. I don't want to go mess with it. And so that is the absolute best way to stay safe out there. And that's one reason why I like uh, doing like photo workshops for bear photography. And, you, you know, this next year we're doing one in July and we actually have one spot that opened up for some dates in July. So check out our website if you're interested. And we'll be releasing our 2024 dates very, very soon. But yeah, when, when you're in that group, especially when you're walking around in places where you might have low visibility, you want to stay together in that consolidated group. You want to make noise. And then if you do see bears, you don't want to approach them. You know, you just want to stop when you see one and just stand there. And they'll know you're there. They can spell you a long ways away in most cases. And then if they're comfortable with you being there, they'll just kind of continue on their normal activity. And sometimes they'll even come closer to you. But if a bear does start to approach you, that's when you want to stand tall, raise your arms over your head, make a lot of noise, and most importantly, do not run. If you run, it invokes their predatory instincts. And guess what? They're probably going to chase after you. Not a good thing. And then slowly back up if needed. And in almost, in almost all cases, you know, a bear is going to back down at that point. But if they continue to act in an aggressive fashion, you may need to use a bear deterrent. And that would be something like bear spray, marine flares, or as a last resort, would be something like a firearm. Now, I've spent a lot of time in bear country. And bear spray, you know, it, it, it can be really good, but you have to have the right conditions. You know, you have to be relatively close to the bear for it to work. The wind can't be blowing into your face or else you're going to get the one uh, getting the spray. And, you know, I've actually had some better luck using like marine flares because those also will really scare a bear when they see that. And then they'll just want to get away from you. And one time I was out uh, backpacking along the Alaskan coast and there's this bear that was like starting to walk straight towards me kind of had his head down. He's just kind of wandering along, just 
and he kept walking towards me I'm like this is weird why is this bear just coming coming at me like this so I got up on a rock and I stood up there and I started waving my arms and making some noise and the bear just kept coming straight at me and so I reached down into my waders and I was gonna pull out this marine flare and the bear is now within like maybe 20 feet of me and all of a sudden it looked up and it's like whoa who are you so he hadn't even known when I was there and then I realized why he didn't know is because the ocean was making tons of noise back behind him that was drowning out any any noise I was making and then the wind was also blowing off the ocean so it was blowing my scent away from the bear and also my voice away from the bear and so like I say you know most of the time they don't want to be aggressive they just want to get away from you and you need to give them the space to do so so here's a bear that's out on the tidal flats you notice out there doing some clamming and we'll talk a little bit about clamming uh, later on so as far as bear activities go uh, you have the mating behavior that happens around mid-May until about to like mid to mid-July or so. You have grazing. You know, there's a lot of places that have meadows that are full of these grasses, especially sedge grass. And the sedge grass is very nutritious for bears. And, you know, it's almost like a bear buffet out there. They'll just be chomping away on this grass like crazy, kind of oblivious to everything else going on around them. Uh, they also will go fishing. You know, when the salmon starts running, they take advantage of those high protein sources and go and catch those fish. And then clamming is also a very productive activity for them where they'll go out on those tidal flats and then they will um, dig around for clams and they'll use those long claws that they have to open them up and eat the clams. And then they'll do a lot of foraging. And foraging is where they'll be uh, gathering berries or insects or other things to, to eat out in, uh, and they pr pr primarily do that more in the alpine areas. And then the other thing that's really cool is when you see the social interactions between bears or groups of bears. And then family units, moms and cubs, those are always a favorite of photographers. So here's an example of uh, grazing out there in the sedge meadows. You know, they just eaten away. And this is usually one of their first food sources, you know, in the spring months. And so before the salmon start running, they'll be out there just eating all the grasses that they can find. Then when the salmon start running, now it's game on. And this is what I call a consolidated food source. When you get a bunch of salmon hitting one of the rivers, then all these bears will just converge out of nowhere to come and take advantage of that high protein um, food source. Clamming is also a very uh, good way for them to get food. And so if you look really carefully towards the bottom of uh, the mom's foot, you can see some open clam shells there and you can see where mom has been digging. And she's also kind of teaching her cubs how to do this. You know, sometimes she'll flick up a clam and let them kind of try to work with it and everything. And it's really fun to watch them do that. But as you can also see, when they're out clamming, they get very, very muddy. And it's really fun to watch the youngsters like playing around in the mud out there. Or up in the mountains, a lot of times you'll see them foraging. You know, in this case, these bears are going to be close to hibernating soon. And so they're trying to eat the last of the blueberries, the salmon berries, everything else that's around them because they really need to get as much fat as they can to survive those cold winter months. And then of course, social interactions. Um, you'll see this more when you have uh, the consolidated food sources where the bears start coming together. And then they'll kind of start posturing with each other. Sometimes you'll even see some fight. Uh, sometimes you'll see the males going after some cubs and things like that. And so there's a lot of interesting social dynamics that happen in groups of bears. And then, of course, the family units are always so cute. Here's that same mom with the three cubs that were out clamming. They ended up going to the shore because uh, they needed to start nursing. So they all jump on mom and they're about ready to, to get a little bit of uh, milk. So as far as timing your trip, you need to decide what types of behaviors you want to capture. And the timing can be very localized. And it's imperative that you do your own research or you go with a knowledgeable guide. 
because you need to know, like, when do the salmon runs typically happen? You know, what are the primary food sources the bears are going to be going after? Is there an event that's going to be happening that will bring larger numbers of bears together? And then you have to look at coastal bears versus mountain bears. Now, if you were to ask me which type of bear is more dangerous, I would say definitely bears that live in the mountains are more dangerous. They're a lot smaller than the coastal bears, but the bears that live in the mountains don't have an, uh, an abundant food source like a lot of the coastal bears do. They're not out there just eating as many salmon as they can in one day. They're trying to do a lot of foraging. And so the mountain bears are also a bit more solitary. It's much rarer to ever see them come together. And so because of that, they often just like to be left alone. And so if you come uh, and surprise a mountain bear somewhere, uh, they may not uh, react favorably to that. And so just be really careful with bears in the mountains. Don't go approach them. You know, one year in Denali, they had a guy that was uh, killed by a bear because he saw one off in the distance and he he said, hey, I'm going to go get a good photo of that bear. And he just kept getting closer and closer to that bear. And pretty soon the bear said, hey, enough with you, buddy. I don't want you encroaching on my space and went over and, and killed him. So just uh, be very careful. Make sure you remember those safety tips. And then also you have to consider the hibernation periods. And um, so that way, you know, when are they going to be starting to come out of the dens? You know, when are they going to be starting their hibernation? Because it doesn't make a lot of sense to plan a trip if you're not going to see very many bears. And so here's a, an example of a bear in Denali area. And, you know, it had just snowed and it's not going to be too much longer till these bears uh, start to hibernate because the food is going to become very scarce once the snow starts to blanket the landscape. So as far as cubs go, photographing those tiny spring cubs, it's a really special opportunity. And the spring cubs are best seen in the early months of the season. We're talking like uh, mid-May through like July. And by the time you get into August and September, the cubs are going to be much larger. It's amazing how much weight they can gain in a short amount of time. And cubs will stay with their mother for about two years. And the yearling cubs uh, by the time they're like a year old, they're already like 80 to 100 pounds. And like I was saying, the male bears will eat cubs in hopes to be able to mate with the female. And so they always got to be watching their backs. But when you see those tiny little spring cubs, they are so adorable. They're always like playing with each other. Their little antics are almost like, almost like little kids in a way. Like they'll go over and be like slapping each other and wrestling and rolling around and disobeying their mom. And oh, it's so much fun to watch them. Now here's a yearling. And this is a very fat yearling out there on the, uh, where they're out clamming. And the reason why this guy is so fat is because uh, he's an only child. So the only child gets all the food that mom is able to produce. And until mom is actually, looks like she's a pretty good, a forager and hunter as well, because a lot of extra fat reserves. And then when I'm out there photographing these animals, oftentimes if I can find a way to include the dynamics of the landscape, I'll do that too. And that's why I like this angle, because then I can get the waterfall in that background, along with the bears out on the tidal flats. So where to go? Well, um, <laughs> The most obvious place is the Southern Alaska coast. And you have places like Katmai National Park, Lake Clark National Park, Kodiak Island, and all the areas around there. And those that has some of the highest concentrations of brown bears anywhere in the world. Another place to see uh, grizzly bears is over in Denali National Park. And those are gonna be more of your mountain type uh, bears. And so they're not as big as the, as the coastal, coastal brown bears and they have very different uh, food sources. And then of course you have in the lower 48, Glacier National Park, the Tetons and Yellowstone National Parks. But you're just not gonna see the numbers and concentrations of bears there that you can see you know, if you go up north to Canada and Alaska. And of course you're gonna have more luck in areas where bears are conditioned to seeing people. And I'll give you an example of that. So here's a map from uh, the Southern Alaskan coast. And over on the right side of that map, 
uh, where that red line starts, that's the Silver Salmon Lodge. And so one year I flew over there to Silver Salmon Lodge, and then I was going to backpack along the coast over to Chinitna Bay, which is at the end of that red line. And so at Silver Salmon Lodge, they do all kinds of bear viewing, and there's tons of bears around there. And the bears are very conditioned to seeing people. So they don't really care if there's a group of photographers standing nearby. But as soon as I got like about a mile from Silver Salmon Lodge, all the bears I would see didn't want anything to do with me. As soon as they'd see me coming like a half mile away, they were hightailing it out, out of there. And it was that way all the way until I got to Chinitna Bay. Over in Chinitna Bay, it's another place where they do a lot of bear viewing. And they're more conditioned to seeing people there again. And so then you're able to actually get those photos. So a lot of it has to do, you know, with the location you go to. Oftentimes these backcountry, more wilderness type locations may not be the best choice as a photographer. So now let's move into photo gear. And the question I get asked a lot, do I need a big lens? And you know, people see these uh, professional photographers out there, you know, with these super telephoto prime lenses are huge, like big old bazookas, you know? And they're like, do I need that lens to be able to photograph the wildlife? And I tell them, well, maybe back in the day, but not anymore. And that's because the reason those super telephotos were good back in the day is because they were faster. You know, having that F4 aperture would let in more light. And so you could uh, photograph at lower ISO values. And that was really important, you know, in the film days and also uh, with the newer or the, the earlier models of digital cameras. But now the digital cameras are getting so much better at combating high ISO noise that that stop or two of aperture that you save by going to a smaller lens is really inconsequential. And those big bazooka type lenses, they are large, they're super expensive, they're really bulky, they're hard to deploy. And so what do I recommend? Well, I recommend that you use the smaller hand holdable zoom lenses. And one that I really like, for example, is like the 100 to 400 millimeter. It's a great focal length range. It's compact. It fits in my backpack. I can easily travel with it. I can whip it out at a moment's notice. And I can also use the same lens for both uh, wildlife and landscape shooting. So as far as hand holdable zooms go, you know, the burden of big lenses is this. If you fiddle too much with your gear, you're going to meet, you're going to have a lot of missed shots. And the bottom line of all this is the best lens is the one that you're gonna actually have with you and that you can deploy quickly. And so I recommend hand holdable zoom telephoto lenses for shooting wildlife for the following reasons. Many times these zoom lenses are as sharp as their super telephoto counterparts, sometimes sharper because you know they're, they're developing a lot of new optical technology with these new lens designs as they come out, especially for the mirrorless cameras. And plus, they're far cheaper. Like you can get a 100 to 400 millimeter zoom lens for like 2,000 bucks. Whereas if you want to get like a 500 millimeter f4 or something like that, you're probably going to be looking at 10 or 11 thousand dollars. And then they are fast to deploy, and they allow you to move around quickly to find the best compositions, to get the best backgrounds, and then you don't have to worry about like trying to set up a tripod and a gimbal and everything else. And then the other reason is being able to zoom in or out is critical when you're trying to capture wildlife of varying sizes and at varying distances. You know, with bears, sometimes you can have them come so close to you that 100 millimeters is too much. And other times you want to be at like five or 600 millimeters because they're a ways out. And there's really no way to do that very effectively with a prime lens because you're stuck at one focal length. And if they come too close to you, all you're going to capture is the eyeball of the bear. And so that's why I love having the versatility of zoom lenses. And so when you select a lens, it's just important that you do your homework, that you re read reviews, you compare dent ben bench testing parameters. And some of the things that you want to look for are things like sharpness, focusing speed, image stabilization, whether that be in the lens or in your camera body the build quality and the weather sealing of that lens, because often you're out there shooting in more inclement type weather, 
the zoom range of that lens. And I put a note here that you really do need that 200 to 400 millimeter range for wildlife. I get a lot of people asking if this, their 70 to 200 millimeter telephoto lens is going to be adequate. And unfortunately, it's not. The 70 to 200 is a great lens if you're doing like portraits and weddings and things like that, but it's not so great for um, nature photography, especially with wildlife. You really need that longer range. And then what is the zoom type of that lens? You know, when I turn that zoom ring, does it cause an extension of the lens or is it a constant fixed length? And that can matter too, especially if you're shooting a lot in uh, more inclement weather, because the ones that extend out, they will tend to suck in more dust, moisture, and other things. And then I get asked a lot about teleconverters. Should you use a teleconverter for further reach? Well, there's uh, the 1.4x variety, and then there's a 2.0x extender. And so if I put a 1.4x extender on my camera body in between my lens and my camera body, it's gonna allow me to zoom in that much further, like 40% further. But it also comes with the loss of one stop of light. And if I put a 2x converter on, now all of a sudden I lose two stops of light. And here is the key. Many autofocus systems cannot work well at a minimum aperture of f8 or darker. And so if you put that 2x extender on one of your lenses, all of a sudden you may find your autofocus system does not work very well anymore. And so the downsides to extenders is loss of speed. So obviously you're gonna lose some aperture and some focusing speed. You've got a loss of sharpness because now you've got another optical element between your lens and your sensor. Uh, you lose some of the, the, the stability because the IS, the VR, the OS doesn't work as well when you have an extender on there. And also they're more prone to producing different types of optical aberrations. So my recommendation, don't go past 1.4X. And then you want to pair the right teleconverter with your lens. Make sure it's the same brand, needs to be the right generation to mate with that particular lens. And it's not always the newest teleconverter either, by the way. And then some lenses can work very well with like a 1.4X converter. Other lenses look terrible and you'd actually be way better off just digitally cropping than to use that extender. And so I recommend if you don't know how things are going to pair, then try renting it first and just see if you even like it. For example, my Sony 100 to 400 millimeter lens is fantastic with the 1.4X converter. I notice very, very little optical degradation with that. But uh, the, my 200 to 600 millimeter Sony lens is not good at all if I try to use that same 1.4X teleconverter. As far as camera bodies go, what are some of the things you should look for? Well, you're gonna need one that has good high, high ISO noise performance. Because very often I'm out there shooting and I need those shutter speeds to be fast. I might be at ISO 2000, 3200, maybe even pushing up to 6400. You know, I need a robust autofocus system that's fast, accurate, customizable, and good in low light. I need a moderately fast burst rate. You know, six to 12 frames per second is sufficient. Although, you know, one of my camera bodies can even go up to 30 frames per second. Um, fast memory cards are a definite. Uh, yes, you need to make sure that you're not skimping on those memory cards because the last thing you want to be doing is out there shooting and all of a sudden your buffer is full and you miss the pivotal moments. Um, In-body stabilization is also a great factor to have because there can be um, multiple dimensions to that stabilization more so than what can be done just in lens. And then the build quality and the weather ceiling is super important. And then you have to ask yourself, do I need a full frame or do I want a crop sensor type camera? And um, that's a lot of that's gonna to depend too on the ultimate image quality you want. And then my biggest tip here with camera bodies is you wanna have two camera bodies. Not only do you have an extra camera body as a backup, but then you can always pair one camera body with your long lens. You can pair the other with a mid-range lens so that way you can take advantage of shooting opportunities uh, without having to change lenses in between. 
And then always make sure you have extra memory cards and batteries, because again, you don't want to be out there with the best wildlife sighting you've had, and all of a sudden you have a dead battery. So here's an example, you know, this is a shot I took at uh, 500 millimeters. And this is a bear that was like diving way down into this deeper river trying to catch some salmon and pin them against the bottom. This is a te technique called depth charging that they don't do very often at all. But then, you know, I whipped out my other camera body and then took a shot at 100 millimeters that's a lot more inclusive of the landscape. And then you can kind of see what he's doing, you know, trying to dive forward and go all the way to the bottom and, and catch the fish. And so by having the two camera bodies, it really expands the number of shots I'm able to get, the type of creativity I'm able to employ. Other gear, tripods and monopods. Obviously having the tripod or monopod will help reduce the burden of holding up your gear, which can get heavy, you know, after an hour or two or so. And the tripod or monopod is also essential when the light is very low or if you want to do any type of video. But the bad thing about tripods and monopods is they're going to reduce your mobility in fast moving situations. You know, if you're trying to move around and get a tripod all set up, well, you might just miss the shot. Or if you've got a monopod on there and you need to suddenly get lower to get a better angle, well, now you got to collapse the whole thing before you can even get lower and you might have also missed the shot. But if you do use one, I would recommend pairing with a gimbal style head. And if you look at that um, picture over there on the right, that is my favorite tripod of all time. It's the Photo Pro Eagle Series E7. And it has a built-in leveling base right into the tripod leg. So it's really fast to get it level after you get it set up. And then I can just attach my telephoto lens on there. And then I have an instant gimbal type head that I can move around, track subjects, or do a more fluid style video with. And it also is a great tripod for landscape shooting whether I want to do like panoramics or night photography or something like that, it's the best tripod I've found out there for doing all around type of shooting. All weather cover. You know, it can be rainy and snowy in these Northern latitudes and you need to have a way to protect your gear from the elements. It can be like one of those super expensive uh, covers made specifically for your camera and lens, or it can just even be a, a plastic bag with a hole you cut out and a rubber band over the front of the lens. As long as it protects your lens, that's all you need. And then the rocket blaster is super important, you know, for blowing off water droplets and other things from the front of your glass, keep helping keep things clean, uh, blow off your sensor if you have to uh, do a lens change. And then, of course, a lot of these bears are out there in very mucky, wet environments. And so you're going to want to have a pair of waders or muck boots in order to go out there with them. So as far as gear summary, carry a lightweight zoom telephoto lens with you. And you're gonna to wanna to try to cover focal lengths in that 100 to 500 millimeter range. Avoid using teleconverters unless you know the 1.4X will work well with your particular lens. Use two camera bodies so you can rapidly switch between a long lens and a mid-range lens. And now we're moving on to shooting techniques. So when I talk about shooting techniques, I'm going to break it down into about five different components. We're going to talk first about depth of field, followed by shutter speed, followed by how we do action shooting, and then we'll look at composition, and then we'll kind of put it all together and talk about, okay, how do we combine these different techniques and make it simple so that way you're not um, getting confused when you're out there in the field. So here's a shot, um, this little cub, you know, detected some danger off in the distance. So it quickly climbed up on its mother's back. So it can kind of get a better view because they can't see very well over that tall grass when they're down low. And I took this shot at 400 millimeters at F7.1. But if you look closely, notice how only the mom is actually sharp. The cub is kind of blurry. And that's because I don't have enough depth of field here to render both bears adequately sharp. So depth of field is essentially how much of an image is acceptably sharp. It doesn't have to be perfectly sharp because only the place where you actually focus, your plane of focus, only that point is going to be perfectly sharp. But then how much of the rest of the frame can we fool our eyes into thinking 
is acceptably sharp. And bears are large animals, and you need a lot more depth of field with them than you need with other wildlife. And so if you decide you want to use a wide open aperture like an F4 or an F2.8 or something, well, then you have to really be sure that you focus right on the eyes. And then you're going to allow that background to go out of focus, get that nice creamy kind of background look. And that's going to be the best technique if you're just shooting a single bear or a nice uh, tightly framed portrait of a bear. But what you'll find is that, let's say you're at 400 millimeters and you take that. Well, the eyes can be nice and sharp, but guess what? At f2.8 or f4, even the nose of the bear can be blurry. And often find, times I find that quite distracting. And so I almost never take bear shots wide open. And so in that case, I like to stop down because I want to see more of the bear's face sharp, or I like to shoot groups of bears. So in other words, I'm shooting like in the f7.1 to kind of f11 range most often. And in general, if you're focusing, trying to focus, and you have a group of bears, you want to focus on the frontmost bear in the group. Because two thirds of the depth of field that you have in that shot lies behind where you focus, where only one third of that depth of field lies in front of where you focus. So here's an illustrative example. And the reason why I wanted to show this one is I took this one at F63, and this is a group of bears. And the reason why this shot ended up working is because the cub and the nose of the mom were on the same plane. If they had been offset a little bit more in front or behind, then one or the other would probably be pretty blurry. But by using the F63, I did get that nice, creamy, kind of out of focus background, which can be quite pleasing to the eye. But if you zoom in and take a look, you'll see that the ear of the mom bear is quite soft. And you'll also see that the cub hiding down in the grass is also quite soft. And if I really wanted to get more of that scene acceptably sharp, I would have had to use an aperture probably like F9, F10, maybe even F11. So here's an example where I took this shot at F11 at 300 millimeters. And the reason why I did that is because I knew I had multiple things in my frame that I wanted to be acceptably sharp. You know, I wanted the salmon jumping to be nice and sharp. I wanted the first bear to be sharp. I wanted the bear behind them to also be sharp. And so by stopping that down a little bit more, I was able to accomplish that objective. Now, a lot of times people ask, well, how do I even know where to start? Well, the best way to know is just to chimp. I recommend chimping on your shots because it helps you make real-time corrections in the field. And by chimping, that means go to your camera, press the play button, look at the shot you just took, zoom in digitally on that shot, and check your detail. And say, okay, is that back bear sharp? Is that front bear sharp? Okay, good. I have enough depth to fill. If not, then maybe I have to stop down a little bit more. And so what are some of the variables in depth of field? Well, first of all, it is how close are you to your subject? And your depth of field is gonna get more and more limiting the closer you get to your subject. But the closer you get to your subject, the easier it is as well to also blur out your background. Then what focal length are you shooting? The longer your focal length, the more limited the depth of field becomes. So if I'm shooting at 400 millimeter, I'm gonna have far less depth of field than if I shoot at 100 millimeters or 50 millimeters. And then what aperture are you shooting? Am I wide open or am I stopped down more? And then what format is your camera? You know, the larger the format, the more limiting your depth of field is going to be. So a full frame camera is going to struggle more getting that large depth of field than will a crop sensor camera. Now that's why you can take these crazy shots with your cell phone with a one inch sensor and everything looks nice and sharp from foreground all the way to background, but there's no way you can pull off that same sort of thing in a single shot with a full frame uh, 35 millimeter format. So as far as shutter speed goes, if you have a relatively static subject, then I aim for the one over X rule when I'm hand holding. 
And the one over X rule says that whatever focal length you are shooting, you want to be one over that focal length in shutter speed or faster. So if I'm at 100 millimeters, I need to ensure I'm at at least one one hundredth of a second or faster. If I'm at 500 millimeters, I need to be at one five hundredth of a second or faster. And then I can go one to two stops under that one over X rule if I turn on my image stabilizer, vibration reduction, optical stabilization, or if I use some sort of tripod or monopod stabilization. But if you do that, just really make sure that you're not gonna get motion blur in your subject. And then another thing I see people doing often is that they will be shooting super fast shutter speeds on static subjects. And they'll be like shooting like one four thousandth of a second or something on a subject that, that's just sitting there. And their ISO is going like crazy high, like ISO 6400 or so. You don't want to do that. And so if you don't need that shutter speed boost, uh, don't shoot there. Because then you're going to get a lot more noise and a lot more grain in your shots. So here's an example. I shot this at f7.1 because I knew I had two bears that I wanted to get acceptably sharp. 430 millimeter. I was at 1 500th of a second because that's going to be my one over X rule. And then because it was fairly dark there in those grass areas, I had to boost the ISO to ISO 2000. But as you can see here, you know, everything's well exposed. Both bears are nice and sharp and the shot works. So as far as shutter speed goes for intermediate type of action, that's anywhere from like one five hundredth of a second up to like one one thousandth of a second. And you can still get some motion blur at those shutter speeds. But oftentimes it can be employed too for creative effect. But if we move into like fast action, that's where we start needing shutter speeds north of one twelve fiftieth of a second, you know, on up to like one two thousandth of a second. You don't really need to go above like one two thousandth of a second most of the time for like shooting bears. Now, if you're shooting birds or something like that, then you would. But in that case, you definitely want to be using the fastest burst rate that you have on that camera. And then the other thing to consider are slow shutter speeds. And those can sometimes provide a really nice creative effect. And in that case, you'd want to use a tripod if at all possible. And then you've also seen those effects where people use like slower shutter speeds and kind of pan along with the motion of the, of the animal. Well, I don't ever advise doing that with bears because they simply, in most cases, never move fast enough to make that effect actually happen. So here's an example of an intermediate shutter speed as this uh, yearling was shaking its head off. And you can see at 1 640th of a second, you know, the face is sharp because that's the axis of rotation, but the fur on the edges, you can see how that's kind of has a bit of that motion blur in it. And also, if you look closely at the water droplets flinging off, they have a little bit of tail to them. And, you know, personally, I kind of like that effect because it almost shows more motion than if I had everything just like perfectly tack sharp in the image. But if I do want everything perfectly tack sharp, then I want to make sure that I have a fast enough shutter speed. And in this case, I chose one two thousandths of a second because I knew I had couple things that I wanted to really get sharp. Uh, the salmon, as it's trying to jump over the falls, you know, it's moving and wiggling and everything. And that, those are very fast movements. And also these water droplets that are flying up, those are also very fast movements. And when the bear actually catches the fish, it's also just boom, super quick. And so in order to make sure I got everything sharp, I had to use that very, very fast shutter speed. Now, this was actually quite a difficult image for me to capture. Because most of the images you see from this, from Brooks Falls here, um, are side profiles of the bears catching fish. And it's very, it was, I found it very difficult to actually get a shot where the bear turned its head to face me and the fish was in the right direction to, to do it. So in order to capture a shot like this, I can't tell you how many thousands of images I took in order to, to get lucky. But then we also have slow shutter speeds that can completely alter the mood of the image you capture. It almost gives it more of that landscape photography type feel, but you have like wildlife in there as well. And in order to do these longer exposures, you do need to have subjects that are standing relatively still. 
And, you know, this group of bears, I got a really lucky moment where there's no fish jumping and they just all stared into the water at the same spot. And I was able to get a nice shot at a quarter of a second. And this was monopod stabilized. I wasn't able to use a tripod here. As far as action shots go, you want to keep your subject in the center with the autofocus engaged while you're shooting. And that's where you want to make sure that you use continuous autofocus. And then you want to use a very fast burst rate on your camera. Make sure that your memory card is fast so you don't ac accidentally fill up that buffer. And then don't worry about composition, just capture the moment. You know, frame your subject loosely so that you have crop margin in post. And that's where these zoom lenses will really shine. And then make sure you give enough space in front of where your subject is moving. And then don't allow the autofocus to jump to the background. So it's important that you use a small enough autofocus zone. So here's another example, you know, where I'm shooting at the one two thousandths of a second because I want that fast, crisp action as this uh, young juvenile is, uh, is running to the water. As far as composition goes, the biggest tip I can give you here is please don't frame too tightly in the field. You have a lot of megapixels on your camera. It's okay to do 20, 30% crop later to, to refine that composition. But if you frame it too tightly and you cut something off or don't have enough margin around your subject, well, you can't do much about that shot. And then you, then you with action shots, I always will set the composition for those in post-processing. And I just try to capture the action in the moment. And then you wanna get down low to get more dramatic photos. And then consider landscape inclusion, things like what I call animal scapes. And then position yourself to get those nice, clean backgrounds. And then avoid messy foregrounds and look for collisions. When I talk about collisions, I'm talking about collisions with other bears, horizon lines, shorelines, anything that's gonna cause a distraction to what the viewer is seeing. And then look for behaviors and interactions, like I said, that will tell a nice story. So, you know, just try to find ways that you can kind of isolate your subjects against that background. You know, this is a case of getting down low. You know, you want to kind of be at eye level of your subject or lower to be able to get the most dramatic type effects. And this is a, an action shot here, and this is probably about a 30% crop from the raw frame. And that way I could set my composition after I took the shot. And then another thing here about getting low, you know, trying to get down below so your subject feels like it has stature and height. Or you, in this case, you know, think about including the landscape if you have something really amazing back behind your subject. And then, you know, if you have the groups and interactions, try to capture that. You know, I talked about collisions. In this case, I had to take a lot of shots of these three cubs. They were always like tightly together. And this is about the best one I could get where they, all three of their heads had enough separation from each other that the shot could work. Or sometimes you can find funny little moments and in interactions. Like here you can see the salmon down at the bottom of the screen. They had eaten their fill, and now mom thinks uh, she's going to take a nap on the, the back of her cub. And then sometimes you find these social type behaviors, like these bears are actually fighting. Uh, you can see like the blood marks on their fur. Both of them have that. And yeah, they were really getting at it. Not, not so pretty. So to put it all together, you want to, I like, I always suggest people for wildlife shooting to use manual mode. You set your brightness with your exposure compensation. Let the camera do the metering for you. And just check your histogram to make sure that you're centered where you want to be. Then you're going to set your ISO to auto. That allows that ISO to dynamically move up or down so that you don't have to think about that when you're in the moment shooting. You're going to set your aperture as per your depth of field requirement. You're going to set your shutter speed as per your action requirement or your focal length requirement. And then you're going to use a fast burst rate with continuous autofocus. And then just be mindful of your backgrounds and compositions. You have two legs. Use those, walk around, and go um, find a different angle if what you see is not very pleasing. So to recap, I talked about brown bears. I talked about safety. We discussed some of the different bear activities that they're engaged in. We talked about where and when to go. Uh, some of the photo gear that you can use, along with some shooting techniques, and ending with a little blurb on composition. 
And so I know our time is getting short, but you know I will open this up for a few questions, but I definitely invite you, please come join me on Facebook, join me on Instagram. I'd love to engage with the broader community over there and come check us out over at actionphototours.com. Or if you wanna come to Canab next March, we'd love to see you at the Outsiders Conference. I got to talk to the B&H team that's working on that. And I need to get out there. I need to, oh. I might have to pull a switch. <laughs> We'd love to see you out there, Derek. <laughs> Definitely. I love it out there. No, this, this was awesome, man. A, a huge thank you again, David. So much information in there. Um, again, if you guys do have any questions, that was pretty comprehensive. I, I had about five questions that you answered throughout, but we do have uh, at least a couple questions that we have lingering out there. One question that comes in that says, awesome images here. If you are using a 430 millimeter focal length, what lens are you using? Certainly not the 100 to 400. Yeah, that'd be my Sony 200 to 600 millimeter. Nice. And what is what lens do you find that you use the most when you're photographing bears? You know, I would say probably the 100 to 400. If I'm photographing coastal uh, brown bears, if I'm photographing mountain bears, then more like the 200 to 600. Okay. Which is the easier or easier to see, I guess you could say. If people were looking, they were going to plan a vacation, they wanted to have the highest chance of seeing bears, what would you recommend? Oh, definitely the coastal brown bears. Okay. And uh, one thing that popped up, David, is you were talking about, you know, how sometimes you'll be shooting at 100 millimeters and even that is too long. That being said, what can you just like, you know, if somebody wanted to go out and plan a vacation, because you hear all these stories all the time where it's like someone's out hiking, they didn't realize how close they were. And then next thing you know, they got a mother bear breathing down their neck. Do you recommend taking tours or going with guided uh, expeditions? Or is it really, you know, is it hyped up that it doesn't happen as much as you might think and you, you can go out there and kind of do it on your own and be safe? Or what do you recommend? I definitely don't recommend doing it on your own unless you have a good amount of experience under your belt. And so until you really learn how to read bear behavior, how to act in bear country, um, it's best to go with a group or with a, a knowledgeable guide. And then after you start learning those tips and tricks and everything like that, that's when you can start feeling more comfortable to do it on your own. Otherwise, the best thing if you are you if you are on your own to stay far away and don't don't approach them. Is there ever a circumstance where you can? I mean, obviously, we you talked about getting getting in closer. Is that something that comes with experience, or is there certain activities that you're a little bit safer? Like if they're in the water feeding or something, you're a little bit you can get a little bit closer. Yeah. So the the way you can do that safely is if they're like fishing for salmon, for example. If you just park yourself in one spot, oftentimes they'll come running like right in front of you because they don't care about you being there. They're only focused on catching fish. Okay. And so it just really depends on how they view you and if they view you as a threat or not. Now, is there any other, because a lot of times, again, we hear about the attacks are when it's a mother with cubs and it's more of a defensive thing. It's not necessarily an attack. They're just defending themselves. Are there any other circumstances that people should be aware of? Or any other times that they're, the danger is kind of heightened? The danger is always heightened when it comes to surprising a bear. Okay. And so if you're out hiking and stuff like that, the best thing you can do is just talk. Bears know what we sound like. They know what our voices are. They don't understand what a bear bell is. And they're like, what is that weird noise? So the best thing you can do is just talk in that way. They know you're coming. If they don't want to be near you, they'll get out of the way long before you ever show up. So anybody out there, just invite Scott Jolson to come along with you. The bears are going to hear you probably from three states away. He's punching his monitor right now. I know he is. Um, no, these are these are all great tips, David. It's, again, it's it's always good, even though we, we never get to see bears. Um, usually the only time I get to see them is when we have a wildlife photographer on. So this is a special treat. Final question. And I'm surprised that somebody didn't ask this sooner. Spirit bears. It's like, are they super elusive? How do you see a spirit bear? Where do you got to go? So there's a special place in British Columbia where you got to go to see them. And there's a number of outfitters that will take you out on the boats and stuff to, to photograph the spirit bears. I have not done it personally, but I know people that have. And yeah, if you go with the right guides and outfitters, then you'll definitely be able to see them. 
Awesome. That'd be a special opportunity. Is it on the bucket list? Are you, you going to try to make it happen? I think so. Someday I'm going to make that happen. Awesome. Well, huge thank you again, David. And you guys have all the information there. If you haven't been able to do so, now's a perfect time to take a screen grab and definitely check out everything that David has going on. But uh, David, huge thank you once again. And I, I, of course, I thank you to all of our viewers for tuning in. But that is it. Another rendition of the BNH Virtual Event Space is in the books. Catch y'all next time. <laughs>